It's my pleasure this evening to welcome our guest, Lorraine Ong, who is currently um, at the Travel Channel. Um, in going through some of the materials just in preparation for the introduction, and don't worry, I like to keep the introduction short, because I know you didn't come to hear me, you came to hear Ms. Ong, um, and she has a lot more valuable information to, uh, to present to you than, than I do. So it, you'll, you'll see that the title for tonight is Build It, Fix It, Reimagine It, your business and your career. Um, and that's what she's going to focus on. And in reading through some of these materials, a couple of things really struck me. And for me, what came across through it all was uh, really how Ms. how Ms. Ong has taken advantage of the of opportunities that either have come her way or ones that she was able to create based, uh, based off what she had already done. Um, among the other things, among many of the things that she's done in her life, uh, she's worked in broadcasting. She's worked in television syndication. She's worked in cable. She's worked in interactive. Um, she began her, her career in television as a receptionist, which, if nothing else, if, if, if nothing else speaks to you about the importance of taking advantage of opportunities that on their face may not be all that terrific, but then the people that you get to meet through those opportunities, um, where it might lead, you never know where it's going to lead you. Um, and again, currently, Ms. Ong is um, at the Travel Channel, um, where she does a lot of branding work. Um, one of the things that the Travel Channel has recently gotten into is it uh, now owns Oyster, which is a travel service like Travelocity, like Kayak. Um, so that's an, that's an example of television, the television business expanding, again, into areas that you might not think of if you're thinking traditionally. Uh, so with that, um, I will let Ms. Ong tell you a little bit about how she got to where she is um, and how you can follow some of her examples. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. You know, when I was first approached to come here to speak, um, I did uh, say, I looked because, you know, I did my research and I went on the website and I looked at who the other speakers have been that have done Must See Mondays. It was, quite frankly, a little intimidating. And I'm thinking, okay, I don't have the big J thing going on, so what could I possibly talk to them about that they're going to care about? And so the person said to me, you know, not everybody ends up going down that path. And your background would be interesting for people to know that they have choices. There are other things you can actually do. So I purposely chose to come here closer to graduation time and closer to a period of time where you're thinking about internships, you're thinking about other things you could be doing because I figured, okay, you know, this could be top of mind because, you know, I'm not going to go down a serious route tonight. I'm going to go down pretty much. It's serious in a way because it's about your career and it's about how are you going to think about it? So, you know, I am very honored that you have asked me to come here and to really share this professional journey that I've had in media, and particularly to speak to students at one of the finest schools of journalism and mass communications. So thank you for bringing me back to Phoenix, which, in fact, is my second home. You know, this is a city where I did so my own news roots earlier in my career when I was a general manager at KSAZ TV. And during that time, I was hired by News Corporation to shepherd the transition of a newly acquired station to be part of the Fox family of owned and operated stations. Now, that was almost 15 years ago, and a lot have changed in the media industry since then. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. I have a 30-year perspective in global media as a senior operating executive in both traditional and new media. And my passion for this work really started early as I progressively managed television stations in ever-growing markets, and subsequently I became an integral early partner in the growth of News Corporation's global cable networks. I was the founding president of National Geographic Channel. And that was forging a partnership between News Corporation and the National Geographic Society. 
and that resulted in the creation of one of the fastest growing networks in the cable landscape. More recently, I was the chief operating officer at Star TV, which is News Corp's company based in Hong Kong, with a footprint that went over 65 countries, 55 channels in 14 languages. Currently, I am the president of Travel Channel Media, and we are the newest member of the Scripps Interactive Networks, home of powerhouse brands like Food Network and HGTV. I'm particularly proud of my track record for forging high-performance teams and fast-paced companies and markets through acquisitions and joint ventures and across a myriad of cultures, economies, and programming tastes. Managing such diverse assets and resource bases in the U.S. and globally has given me a uniquely powerful insight to the changing global customer and their demands on our industry. More notably, though, through all of these experiences, I have been fortunate to have developed strong relationships across these multinational corporations. And this has afforded me direct access to key decision makers whom I considered trusted friends and confidants and have proven to be invaluable assets as I expand my experience base across various disciplines and platforms. Now, interestingly enough, I do a lot of speeches mostly in front of professional organizations, but seldom do I get the opportunity to actually have this kind of experience with a room full of really bright, young, aspiring colleagues. So much of the excitement comes from the unknown, the limitless potential that lies in each of your futures through the work that you're going to do in the media landscape and that in this hyper-competitive, ever-changing technology through platforms and consumer behaviors. That's exciting. And I was very privileged to spend some time earlier today watching your live news watch. And I have to say, I was pretty impressed. Now, what you just heard me tell you earlier about my background is my elevator pitch, something all of you need to get good at through every stage of your career, because you just never know who you're going to meet in an elevator or at a cocktail party. And oftentimes, when people hear me tell my elevator pitch, people will say to me, I want that, meaning I want that career. How do I do that? Can I do that? If I eat what you eat, if I do what you do, will I get that? Well, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Build it, fix it, reimagine it, your career and your business. All right, so how much in your life is serendipity and how much is a plan? As I was thinking about this presentation today, it occurred to me that my career followed very similar trajectories as many of the businesses that I managed. So let's start with, how do you build a career? From an early age, I had a broad plan. And when I say early, I'm talking about eight years old. I always knew I wanted to run something. I didn't know what the something was, but I knew some here and here, I wanted to run it. So you do need a direction, and you do need a plan. And yes, you do need a little serendipity. Most importantly, the ability to recognize it when it shows itself to you. And you need the courage to take yourself out of your comfort zone and to pursue opportunities that either you help create or show up unexpectedly on your doorstep. However, I am also a big believer there are no coincidences in life. So I grew up in a traditional Chinese household where I was expected to enter a respectable career, and teaching fell into that category. My brother, on the other hand, was expected to become a doctor or lawyer or something along that line. So that's where I was headed into a teaching career. And so when I graduated from college, I had a teaching position lined up for the fall semester in a high school in Manhattan. But I wanted to do something constructive during my summer, after I graduated before the fall, so I looked for a job, and that's where my first opportunity showed itself to me. A small independent television network, TVS, stood for Television Sports. They were looking for a receptionist. I applied for the job. I got it. So here's the good news. It was a small company, and in small companies, what's great about that, you roll up your sleeves, they pretty much will let you do most anything. And as fate would have it, within the first month of my job, a position came up as one of the assistants was leaving. So, you know, in a small company, they leave the doors open, they talk, ever, you can hear everything. And I overheard the conversation as they were talking about how were they going to fill this position. So one of the principals said, why don't we promote Lorraine into this job? So the owner of the company said, 
Oh no, we can't do that. She's the best receptionist we've ever had. She gets the names and numbers right. She has a great attitude. Everybody likes her. What was I supposed to do now? And I did hear all of this. So recognizing that if I handled this situation correctly, I could turn it from a problem from, from, for the owner into an opportunity for both of us. So at the end of the day, I went in to speak to my boss. And first I apologized for having overheard the conversation. Then I said, oh, and thank you for the very kind words that you said to me. And then I pitched. I gave them a solution. If they would promote me to the open position, I promised that I would train the new receptionist to do the job as well, if not better, than I. So my pitch worked, and I was able on my first job to learn all aspects of a sports network and at the same time mentor someone. You know, that was a very big lesson for me very early in my career about value creation. It required the courage to speak up, but to also to have a plan that would both help the objectives of the company and my desire to grow. Now, reflecting back to my experience you know, as a college student, I'll be the first to tell you I had no plans or any idea that I was actually going to be in media before earning my degree. But once I got into the business, I had a very good sense that this was the right industry for me and that it was not one I was leaving any time soon. Oh, and by the way, that teaching position, it became, an, at the end of the summer, it became an opportunity for somebody else. So ironically, those teaching skills I learned in college have gotten a lot of use. During my career, I have found that mentoring, counseling, and instruction that I've provided for staff members makes regular, regular use of those teaching skills, and they're just done in a different setting. So early in my career, I did recognize how dynamic the media industry actually is. And it was also clear to me I had a lot to learn. So setting my sights on understanding as many facets of the media landscape as possible became priority one. I accomplished much of this by designing a career path that gave me the opportunity to sit virtually on every side of the desk, be it a small independent sports network like TVS, a large broadcast network like CBS Sports, a sports franchise like the Chicago White Sox, a sports syndication uh, a programming studio syndication like the Mary Tyler Moore Studios, or running TV stations, running cable networks, or even large global entertainment entities. These diverse experiences afforded me a unique view of the industry. Throughout my career, I purposely made great efforts to not just stay within my circle of friends and colleagues, but to deliberately stretch myself to meet and work with people who believed in me and who were in positions to offer me opportunities to do jobs I have never done before. And the theme of purposeful growth and change has been a constant through my career. I intuitively understood that I needed to constantly demonstrate my ability to operate outside of my comfort zone and to create value everywhere I went. So from TVS, I had a stop at CBS Sports, and from there I went to the Chicago White Sox, where we started one of the first regional sports networks in the country. I didn't have a true passion for sports, so I was a little concerned about that. It was not clear to me where a path in sports was going to take me. So that is another key lesson that I will impart upon you. Having a passion for what you do is really important. It is true that they say, love what you do, and you will never work a day in your life. So realizing that I didn't have a passion for sports, it was time for me to move to the other side of the business where I had some interest and some passion. And that required a move over to the entertainment side of the business where I sold and learned about programming syndication at the Mary Tyler Moore Studios, distributing shows like St. Elsewhere, Hill Street Blues, Bob Newhart to TV stations around the country. I'll bet none of you have ever heard of any of those shows. So all along the way, I've had mentors that gave me invaluable guidance. And one of those mentors did say to me, you'd be a great general manager at a TV station. And you know what? I had never even considered that path. But after discussing it further, I researched the skills and experience that was necessary in order to be considered for a general manager's position. And so I set on my path, and again, with a plan. At that time, general managers came from one of two career paths. You came, either came out of sales or you came out of news. 
I was already on a sales path, so I figured that's the path I should probably stay on. And I sought out jobs at television stations. So my first opportunity was at WPVI in Philadelphia as an account executive. Now, I knew I had to climb a sales ladder to become a sales manager. So a sales manager's position actually came up at WPVI, and I pitched it. So here, I had another life lesson. I was told, yeah, I don't think you're ready. You need to pay more dues. So of course, I thought, I'm ready. <laughs> and so I quickly decided that the opportunity wasn't going to happen anytime soon for me in Philadelphia. So I started reading the trades from the back to the front. My research surfaced a sales manager's position at Cron in San Francisco. And this is where your network matters. This was one of those instances where my network provided a crucial assist in getting this position at KRON. The general manager at Cron at that time wanted the Oakland A's on that station. Understanding this, my baseball background and my, all of my network went into action, and they did help me get the job. So many other valuable lessons were learned along the way. Not wanting to be a sales manager for another five to 10 years was a bit of an existential crisis for me. Because at that time, you needed to spend five or 10 years of your life, it was pretty much required dues one had to pay to get a nod to become a general manager at a TV station. So clearly another strategy was necessary for me in order for me to get to my coveted goal of becoming a general manager. So that's where the fix it part of my, or fine tune it, of my plan had to come into play. I knew that I was accruing some really great experience with the performance track record to back it up. So what was next? So this is also where serendipity, your network, and fate do come into play. During this time, regional sports networks were coming into their own. My sports background, once again, paid me dividends. A former colleague called and said, you know what? Would you come and be my assistant general manager and to aid him because he was having health problems? And he told me he would groom me for his job. So off to Chicago I went and to this position, the experience that it provided and the exposure to key executives led me to gaining general manager experience at a regional sports network. That was important because this credential told people that I had broad management capability and I could manage a P&L which ultimately gave me the nod to become a general manager at a television station. Now, having ongoing conversations with my network or colleagues and friends have been a real key factor in building a successful career. And I want to make special emphasis of that point. Most of my next opportunities come from places and from people that knew of me through my mentors or through my network. More importantly, my brand and my reputation as a value creator was being established. I was increasingly being seen as a person who had the courage and the fortitude to do the hard, messy jobs. The person who would clean up and correct failing situations and turn them around into winners. Both of the television stations I was asked to manage were Fox-owned and operated stations. And my track record of growing ratings and revenue allowed me then to be considered for a joint venture opportunity, National Geographic Channel. Now, I've done a startup business before with regional sports businesses, but Nat Geo was the first big national network that needed to be built from the ground up. I can tell you the exact day I started, April 17, 2000, and I will tell you that my charge was you're going to launch this network on January 1st, 2001. You're going to go and hire 200 people, and you're going to start a network, and you're going to flip the switch, and you're going to be live. Well, I have to tell you, it was daunting, scary. Some might just call it crazy. Not everyone has the stomach for a startup, and it is important to know what you're getting into, and more critically, if you have the right skills before jumping in headfirst. And looking back at my career, this was one of the more rewarding challenges that I've ever had. After a seven-year run as the founding president of National Geographic Channel and putting it squarely on the competitive cable landscape map, I received another fortuitous call, an opportunity to go and help fix one of News Corp's bigger businesses, Star TV, based in Hong Kong. Now, I did say to them when I did get the call, I may look the part, but I really don't. I can't speak it, I can't do other things. They said, no, we're not hiring you because you look the part. 
right. We, so within News Corp, I had created a portfolio of being a builder and fixer of businesses. And to me, this assignment, however difficult the challenge was going to be, was in fact a reward. I packed my bags in record time, and I was on that plane to Asia. So going to start was both professionally and personally very rewarding for me. The experience required me to dig deep into every experience and lesson I had ever learned and to apply it quickly to a very dynamic environment. However, as in life, things change. There was a changing of the guard at News Corp. And let me tell you something, no matter what company you go to in the media landscape, this happens more often than not. Companies get bought and sold, you have a new boss, you have a new manager, things change. So it allowed me the opportunity to come back to the US and the event gave me, made me available to become president of the Travel Channel. So up to this point, we've gone through a career that required a plan, reinvention, courage, value creation, and constantly being out of your comfort zone. And I will tell you, if you speak to anybody who has ever worked with me and for me, they will tell you that I have constantly pushed them out of their comfort zone. And while they don't like it at the time that it's happening, they always thank me afterwards because that's the greatest amount of growth that you will always have in your life. Thinking fast on your feet and being female in a very male environment like sports made many of my choices very challenging. However, opportunities lie where the jobs are messy and they're hard to do. And the old adage is true. The more difficult the task, the higher the reward, providing, of course, you can deliver results. So, you know, and I could spend the next few hours talking about startup businesses like Sports Channel and National Geographic Channel or the fix-it businesses like TV stations and Star TV. And since we don't have all the time in the world to do that, I'm going to focus on how do you reimagine a business in today's hyper-competitive environment? And as one might think that all the challenges and experience that I've had, this should get easier. Guess what? It doesn't. The fact is, the bar has been raised at the com and the competitive landscape is tougher than ever before. Why? All networks have more resources than they've ever had before available to them. Technology, as you know, is changing at a very rapid rate, which impacts the way consumers are experiencing media. So all of that brings us to the present and to Travel Channel. And now you get... Now we're going to... So... So this again, as I went through a lot of my stops along my path on my career, remember the one thing that you're doing as you go out and you embark upon your career. You're creating a narrative. You're creating not just a life narrative for yourself, but a career narrative. And you want to think about, how does that career narrative going to sound as I'm talking about myself? And as a recruiter or someone's reading my resume, how do you want that to look? It's really important that you think about that when you make certain choices on where you choose to go. Not every place has to be a big, well-known place, but it doesn't hurt to have a few that people can go, oh, okay, I know what that is. I get that one. And then you can have a couple of other things sprinkled along the way, but make sure that every time you talk about it, you can point to, this is what I did for them while I was there, and that it is summarized there because that's the most critical part of your narrative. So let's talk a little bit about Travel Channel. You know, Travel Channel's been around for, believe it or not, 25 years. It's had a lot of owners. And the first owner, in fact, was TWA Airlines. And they created the channel primarily because they wanted a Barker channel to get people to go and fly the airline. That would make sense. Um, however, they weren't really committed to being in media. They weren't really committed, and they realized that, oh, my God, in order to do a network or a channel or whatever it is, it's going to cost me a lot of money. I don't want to do that. I just want people, you know, I don't want to spend the money over there. I just want people to come fly my airline. So they then sold it to Landmark Communication. Landmark Communication is the original owner of Weather Channel based in Atlanta. Um, and Landmark then turned around, sold it to Discovery Networks, and so Travel sat at Discovery for a few years. It wasn't one of the more important networks that they had, so they then said, okay, we're going to sell you, and it went over to Cox Communications, and Cox then turned around three years ago and sold it to Scripps Networks Interactive. 
Now, I will tell you that in the 25-year history for Travel Channel, this by far is the best home for this network. Why? Because when you look at how Scripps looks at their portfolio and what they do with their businesses, it's about they have a long view of the business. They care about brands. They care about the quality of the audience that comes to their brands. Now, I'm sure some of you may have seen Honey Boo Boo or, you know, shows along that line. And you know what's out there in the television entertainment landscape. And so the one thing I will say about Scripps and their networks, they will never go there because their brands are everything to them. And they like to say, we own the food category with Food Network and Cooking Channel. We own the home category with HGTV and DIY. And now we own the travel category with Travel Channel. So if some of you used to watch Travel Channel back a few years ago, you probably saw poker on there. And why poker was on there, I don't really know. Um, people used to give me the explanation, well, it happens in Las Vegas. Well, things happen everywhere. So, you know, when you're thinking about what should be on a network, well, you know, you can, you can justify almost anything. But it wasn't really building a brand. And then when you didn't have poker on, it had a lot of travel log programming on it. And travel log programming is old style television. And the fact is, Travel Channel cannot be a network about something that you only go to or think about as a two-week vacation, a passport, and a train ride. It can't be. It needs to be a place that you go to for entertainment. You're going to learn something. You're going to have a little bit of takeaway. And yes, it does have travel theme to it. Yes, you may get inspired to do something. So three years ago when I got there, the network basically looked like this. We had four pillars, four basic shows. Tony Bourdain, who has now gone over to CNN <laughs> uh, on, on Sunday, um, and uh, Adam Richman, Man vs. Food. Uh, and we have Andrew Zimmern, who does Bizarre Foods, and we have our Ghost Adventures guys with Zach Baggins. We basically had four shows and a lot of filler, and that was it. You cannot build a network off of that. And we had a lot of work to do in front of us to move the needle. So when you get to a network and you have a new owner and you're thinking about, okay, what do we have to do now? Well, as you all know, no matter what business you go into, there's going to be a metric in which you're going to be judged on. I get a report card every day called ratings. I know exactly how well I'm doing at any given moment. And so the 1.0 is... On, on this is you get there, you have to move quickly because when people pay a lot of money for your business, they want results quickly. So you have to figure out how do I create results quickly, but also have a longer term strategic plan for how I'm going to get there. If you don't have a strategic plan and you don't understand your audience and you don't have a brand promise, well, you can have a lot of expensive failures that don't build any equity. Um, for the audience, or you don't have sustainable results. So we're right now, we're in what we affectionately call in the industry upfronts. And upfronts is about when all the networks on the cable and, and broadcast landscape go and pitch advertisers in which you tell them how great you are, what you're going to have next year, and why they should spend more money on you than somebody else. So when I got there, so this is an upfront tape from two years ago. And so part of this is to show you, and you'll see a progression of the brand. So first we'll take a look at 2011 and what was going on then. Here's to stories and to surprise around every corner. Here's to burning the guidebook. Here's to finding your passion, even in a pile of sand. Here's to finding cool, no matter what time zone you're in. Here's to adrenaline. Here's to the kid and all of us. Here's to being told it's impossible. And doing it anyway. Here's to hidden gems going places where the sun doesn't shine. Ow! Here's to bonding with your buddies. It's a guy thing. Woo! 
No, that's... Here's to the unknown. Oh, my God! Here's to capturing the moment. Here's to new experiences. One step at a time. Here's to diving in. million moments. That's the power of travel. Travel channel. Travel here. So, not bad. Watch that and you're going, okay, you know what? I might watch that network. But the fact is, we thought, you know, we had to get something out quickly. Um, we had to take some guesses on certain shows. There were shows on there called Death Wish Movers about a moving company. There was a show called Mancations. But we didn't really know our audience. And we didn't realize how weak the business really was that was acquired. We didn't have a library. We didn't have a big development pipeline. Big problem. I had to build a whole new team. Another issue because everybody has a steep learning curve and it almost does take a year to actually learn and figure out what you're doing. We had to understand our audience. We had to get the right people in the right chairs. We needed a cohesive strategy that everybody bought into, but most importantly, we needed patience. Because sometimes you try things, and how many times, you know, when, when September comes around and broadcast comes out and you're checking out all these shows, and then before you know it, you kind of like something and it's gone. <laughs> well, that's what happens in our business. If it doesn't work, it's gone. The great thing about the home and Scripps provides is they have a lot more patience. And because the environment is so hyper-competitive, you do have to sometimes let things air out a little to allow people to find you. And particularly if you believe in a show and it's quality and you have to let it rest a while. So my marketing team spent a lot of brain cells on thinking about a brand and a brand vision and what it was going to mean to us and something that our programmers were going to have to live by and that they were going to have to figure out what is the lens that we're going to use in which we're going to look for programming. So at Travel, we like to say we're reimagining the travel experience. Well, what does that mean? Well, basically it means that you're not, we're not just thinking about this as a vacation network. I don't know how many people here have seen some of our programming recently, like a Hotel Impossible, Baggage Battles. We do things that are related to our industry, but still sit squarely in the entertainment space. We still do have aspirational, inspirational shows, but it's not on that soft side. When you look at what is on the entertainment landscape, you have to be able to push that entertainment button. And also, on the travel strat- on, when we look at our strategy and we talk about what it is that we're trying to do, any business you go into, any company you go into, you have to remember what are the goals of the business. So when we do all-hands meetings for everybody in the company, it is critical that everybody on my team understands what are you working towards here. When you come every day to this job, what is it that we're trying to do? What is the needle we're trying to push here? Well, clearly, it's about a brand that we're trying to build, and the brand hopefully will enable us to pick the right programming, the programming will bring us great ratings, and all of that will then bring us revenue. In a nutshell, that's what it's about. And if you can do that, you've got a winning formula. How about an adventure? Let's go. Stand up. When I move. 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 Hungry? Mmm. Bizarre Foods America is all about exploring culture through food. A taste of the Midwest, baby. This year, it's going to blow your mind. Wow. It's time to flip it. Come on. <laughs> Trip is about finding people on the street. Free vacation. Who wants it? Giving them the adventure of a lifetime. Say yes. Yes. <laughs> I pay for everything. I plan activities you couldn't imagine. Let's see what's inside. Oh. 
Hotel Impossible is back. New hotels, new wake up calls. There's a bear 20 feet from the guest room. Now, can you the guest? We'd help struggling people save their hotels. Oh, oh yeah, are you serious? <laughs> I'm Don Wilder. You can't believe how many museums there are in America. You can't believe how many artifacts are in those museums. This could be the find of the century. Each one of them having their own fascinating story. Welcome to MIA, baby. This season, you're going to get to see things that you've never seen before. 115,000 people come through here every day. We have a very serious situation. Something is going to happen, and we just have to be prepared. Got a brand new <laughs> Here we go. Baggage Battles is back and bigger than ever. This season, there's more auctions, more items, and more money. Oh, yes. Travel entertains you. Travel lifts you. Travel expands your life. Travel, travel, travel moves you. So... Here we are. That was our returning series upfront tape for this year. Um, you've noticed there's a logo evolution. There's an attitude evolution. When we talk about travel moves you, it's meant in a couple of ways, physically, emotionally. And it's something that we have found the evolution of the network has started to resonate strongly with our viewers. And it's something that... Um, we have found uh, is a working strategy for us. And when we look at our programming, they really fall into four buckets. You know, we have our inside travel, which is our airport 24-7 shows, you know, our guided traveler like Andrew Zimmern. Our traveler feasts and finds falls in that food paradise category for us, baggage battles on valuation shows. Our traveler intrigue is about mysteries at the museum and shows along that line. And traveler good times. Summer is a big time for us, and we have a lot of coasters, we have water parks, we have RVs, and so this has allowed our programmers to really go out into the production community and say, bring us programming that falls generally into these buckets, and you'll probably have a good shot at figuring out something for us. So I'm going to show you what we've got that's new that's coming up, um, and then... I think that's what's next on here. Yep. Yes, who? What's the move? What's the move? What's the move? Out with the old, in with the new. I'm Brett Michaels, and I'm going to rock your RV. My new show, Rock My RV, is about taking slightly tattered RVs and turning them into radical mobile mansions. Bring her in. These are real, real RV people. This just needs a little Michael's magic. There is a fine line between creative and crazy, and I'm about to blur it. I'm going to rock you. your RV. I'm out of Richmond, and my new show is all about the greatest fans on earth. Fans of music, sports, culture, you name it. Two fanatics who are all about passion, dedication, and just pure fun. That's how we do it. People for whom tailgating isn't just a meal in a parking lot, it's a religion. This is pandemonium. like diamonds in the sky. Jim Hunt is a global quest for the rarest stones in the world. I am Ron LeBlanc. I will do anything to bring these gems home. I take a rough stone like this, I cut and polish it. This is worth $2,000, this is worth $30,000. That is the dream. That is right? the dream of the gem hunter. Oh my god. So good. So good. My name is George Motes. For years, I've been crisscrossing America in search of the best hamburgers. I'm not out here to eat just any burger. It's incredible. This is like the holy grail of burgers. <laughs> My job is to find the good ones. It's a taste explosion. I'm Todd Carmichael. My job is to go to some of the planet's most dangerous places. That drops off, man. That stopped my heart. And search for the very best coffee possible. Oh my God, this is it. Mamma mia! It's like candy. I'll be shot at. You're going into war. Coffee is always evolving. There's always that next level. And that fuels me. That's my fix. I love my job. 
My husband Michael is a special forces combat veteran. My wife Ruth is a journalist and experienced yes, survivor. They think they're going to put us down. No idea. Together we're lost somewhere on Earth. Our mission to survive until we find our way back to civilization. This is going to be hell on Earth. Time to go to work. Travel moves you. Travel moves you. What's the move? Only on Travel Channel. It moves you. If you, if you, uh, let's see, we Burgerland premieres tonight at 10 o'clock. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, it's been quite an evolution. Um, we started out earlier, as I showed you three years ago, with four faces, and now this is a sample of uh, our family. Um, we've grown quite a bit, uh, and it has been quite a journey for us, and clearly the journey isn't over. You know, Scripps you know, bought Travel Channel primarily because they see us as a huge growth engine for them for the future. You know, both food and home are mature businesses for them. And in order for them to really see some nice growth for the entire enterprise, you know, they did acquire this network. So we've got a lot more growth ahead of us. But as you can see, you know, an evolution has been going on. It has to happen. And I'm sure if you know, you watch the network next year and the year after, you'll see further evolutions of how the network will continue to evolve because that is what has to happen. So as to wrap up, and just to pull together a lot of what we talked about earlier, you know, as I even heard earlier today at Newswatch, have a plan. It was good that that was a theme for them today as well. Uh, you need to build your brand and have the courage of your convictions. You need to develop your network. You need to seek mentors and be a mentor. Take yourself out of your comfort zone and reinvent. And always create quality and value no matter where you go and what you do. So thank you, and I'm open for questions. Um, I'm curious as uh, to shows like Get Lost, where they're supposedly lost in the middle of nowhere and they have to find their way back. Um, how much truth is there to those actual shows? Actual, tr actually true. That actual is the, truth. Yeah, that is the one thing about our brands um, that you know we try very hard that we do not script them, we don't stage it. They really are lost somewhere, and they actually do have to find their way back to a city. So, what about the camera crew that's with them? The camera crew kind of knows where they have to get to, but they can't tell them. Okay, so they're just right. The ride. So yes. Okay, and then do you still have the the ghost hunting? Show yes, we on? do. You do. Yes, we do. They, okay. They're very popular, Zach. <laughs> okay, just curious. Hi. Um, so, what goes on for the selection process for those shows? Uh, you know, the people that you choose. Why is it? Why is it that you choose them? What happens is our programmers and our development team, they get pitched shows. And so if that's a side of the business that you become interested in, um, you know, you go work for a production company, you have ideas, you go to networks, and you pitch your ideas, and you usually have talent associated with it. And so usually you'll come with an idea and you'll say, hey, I have this idea, get lost. And oh, by the way, you know, here's the talent that we would suggest. So sometimes you accept the talent they bring you, or sometimes you like the idea, but you have talent that you want to use instead. So it just depends. Hi there. Hi. Is this on? Um, I'm wondering, I see that uh, Samantha Brown is, is on the TV screen. Uh, how does she fit into the framework of the Travel Channel since many of her specials in the past have been more travelogue focused as opposed to perhaps the new vision of the right. channel? Very good. 
you do pay attention. <laughs> I mean, um, yes, Samantha, uh, definitely everywhere I go and whenever I say I'm a travel channel, everybody, oh, I love Samantha Brown. She is my favorite. She is great. And Samantha is great. So she is actually recovering now from having had twins uh, just recently. And she is actually coming back. And we do have a new show for her um, that will show an edgier, funnier side of her. Um, I don't know how many people here are Bourdain fans, but he does a holiday special at the end of the year. And last year he did a special and Sam was in it. And if you haven't seen it, you have to, it's actually very funny. So I saw the holiday special and I'm like, Sam, if you can be like this all the time, you're in. So um, I would say look for Sam. She will be reinvented, and I think in a very fun way, and she's actually anxious to do it because I think she felt she had to be that very sweet girl next door, and so she was role-playing someone who actually isn't the true Sam. Over here? Yeah. So at one point you were talking about your life narrative and your career na narrative. Where have those sort of conflicted along your path, and how, how did you deal with those, moving around so much? Well, you know, um, the, the interesting part about me, and, and this, is, this comes down to knowing yourself, and um, I don't know that when I started out that I was going to know that I was going to live in so many cities, countries, um, and I will say that I think my parents thought that, why are you moving so much? You know, why, why, are you, why don't you just stay in one place? Um, how are you supposed to, you know, have a normal life? Well, that was normal for me. So for me, moving around and living like that, I love what is new and what is possible somewhere. I also know that if you move somewhere and you go somewhere and you do something and you don't like it, guess what? You don't have to stay there. You can move on to somewhere else. But when I do go and do something, I give it everything. I try and learn everything I can. When I move to a city, I've lived in places like Ames, Iowa. Yes, believe it or not, I did live there, thanks to my husband. Um, and. I had fun. I, I knew I wasn't going to stay there forever, but we found the most fun things to do there, and I made the most out of it. But not everybody wants to do that. So it, you have to just know yourself and know what's going to make you comfortable and what you're willing to do for your career. What's your minimum time requirement to stay in each job? You should stay at a job for at least a couple of years, long enough to have established um, a track record of having done something. Um, I always, I advise people all the time, you know, people will call me, they're into a job and they just got there and it's in their first year, they hate it, I want to leave, and it's only been six months, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh no, don't, don't, don't go on, you know, stay there, because how are you going to explain why you left? Um, and so if you hate it that much, I say stay at least a year and just give it what you can. And the best part is to give it a couple of years. Uh, and then you'll probably know as much as you want to know in that particular job. If in the company you're at, in a couple of years, and if you're good at what you do, you probably should be getting promoted or something should be happening. So if you stay at a company, about every couple of years, you know, you should know and they should know where you're at. And you should, particularly when you're really young, because you want to accrue as many experiences as you can. But don't short shrift it. You got to spend the time. You got to do the grunt work. You have to do things. You know, my early jobs and even in a lot of the startup businesses, when, I, when tapes had to be delivered somewhere and I looked around, there was... No, I had to carry tapes. And so I am never below. People are always surprised. If you call my office, many times I answer the phone. You just have to do sometimes what you have to do. But two years is what I would suggest. That's about the pattern that I had. What is your best advice for overcoming setbacks and having to come up with plan B? Ah, okay. So... When I was at Cron in San Francisco <clears throat> and I took that job, the general manager really liked me. And 
and we bonded and you know, it was a really great thing. However, she wasn't my hiring manager. So I had to work for a sales manager who really wasn't happy that she was a little forceful about that decision. And he made my life miserable. It was horrible. And, and I would come to work, I'd have a stomach ache, Sunday would come around, I'd go, oh my God, this is terrible, I can't, you know. So at some point in time, I had to make a decision. It is the first time, the only time that I've actually left a job and didn't have a job. That's how unhappy I was. There are certain things that you're going to find yourself in a situation that you are just so unhappy, it isn't worth it. It just isn't. And your dignity and everything else is much more important, and sometimes you need to just take a deep breath. And that's when you have to know, and you have to go, and you have to dig deep in yourself and go, you know what? I'm smart. I'm good at what I do. And hopefully it's not the first job that happens and that you've built a little bit of a track record because somewhere along the line, you're going to work for somebody you don't like. It happens. You hope it's not going to be horrific, but sometimes it is. And so what I did was I left and I had to figure out what's my next plan. So I explored a lot of other options. You know, maybe I was, my brother tried to convince me I should go on to Wall Street and do something like that. And, you know, somebody else said, oh, my, my husband tried to convince me I should go and do fundraising for the university and I should, what, he goes, you know how to raise money, you can go do that. But it wasn't in my heart and it wasn't my passion. I knew that I loved media. And I knew that I knew how to create value in media. So I stayed on that path, and I just kept pursuing my network and looking at other ideas. And I finally did recalibrate, and I got back on a path. But those things do happen. With all of your experiences and like all the different companies that you've worked for, is there anything that you haven't done yet that you would like to do? Um, you know, that's, that's a question people ask me now, um, you know, what do you want to do next? And quite frankly, um, I would take another international assignment uh, in a second. And I would tell you that too. If you have an opportunity to do an international assignment, do it. Particularly, you don't have kids, you don't have a lot of commitments, you don't whatever, because it will broaden you in a way that you can't possibly imagine. You will learn things. You will learn things about yourself. You will learn things about the industry. You will learn things from a global perspective. You're going to find out just how parochial people are when they just live in one place. Um, And all of a sudden, you will have such a broad perspective on the world. And you will actually become a better American as a result of that, too, because it will give you such perspective that you can't possibly know if you don't do it. Anybody else? Great. Well, no. All right. Thank you. It's great to see everybody. <laughs>